So hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to talk about Health Sentinel, which is a mobile crowdsourcing platform for self-reported surveys that provides early detection of COVID clusters. And this is again, at the beginning of the pandemic in San Luis Potosí, um, a state in Mexico. And uh, as is kind of characteristic of uh, uh, research within uh, this conference and this broader research community, it's a very, it, it, it was a large project undertaken by multiple entities a very interinstitutional project with both academic institutions such as the Potosinian Institute of Science and Technology, but also the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí, as well as government institutions such as the Secretary of Health of the state and the Commission of Protection Against Sanitary Risks. And so just a brief overview of the talk, I'll, I'll begin by giving a bit of context with uh, regards to how the, the Health Sentinel, and I'll often be using the acronym in Spanish for Health Sentinel, which is CDS, so how the CDS came about, um, and this is again, is in the context of the beginning of the pandemic in San Luis Potosí. And then I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the methodology that the CDS undertook and mention some of the results and how uh, at the early stages of the pandemic, the tool ended up being a useful way of inferring clusters uh, before they happened or before they were verified with the extremely limited resources to verify um, actual outbreaks in, in the state. And we'll, we'll, I'll reflect a little bit on, the, on this entire process or the environment that gave rise to this collaboration between research and, and policy, um, while also giving some future directions and well, current and future directions that we're undertaking beyond this initial scope of the project which, you, we've, um, which you've studied for now. And so just some initial context. Um, well, so some context on San Luis Potosí, uh, my home state, it's located in central Mexico and it's a, a medium sized state population wise of the country with a population of roughly 2.8 million individuals um, split into four different areas of, of the state of the Altiplano area, Centro Media, uh, Centro where, where San Luis Potosí, the capital city is, and, and ending with the Huasteca region, which is a, a more jungle region with a higher presence of indigenous communities. And the capital of San Luis Potosí is the population of roughly 1.2 million, where we'll actually the bulk of the focus of the study will be in the capital of San Luis Potosí in the metropolitan area. And to give some context on the early pandemic in San Luis, uh, the temporal scope of the study is what is now actually eons ago in COVID time, but uh, is from March to August, 2020 where the platform that uh, I'll get into more detail soon collected information and, and, and we studied the, the platform data from the scope of April to August of that year. And in Mexico, although there had been confirmed cases for as late as February, a nationwide health emergency wasn't declared until April. And at this time of this study, there had been roughly 650,000 confirmed COVID cases, 450,000 recoveries and um, roughly 70,000 deaths, which gave rise to a, and the key parts here being the final two bullet points of this list, that the case fatality ratio at the time was very high for Mexico, 10%, the second highest in the world. And there was an extremely low testing rate. Um, it, this has gotten marginally better over time, but nonetheless, this is a salient feature of, of what gave rise to this study, that roughly 0.4 qPCR tests were given for every thousand inhabitants of, um, of the country. And San Luis Potosí as a state did not fare much differently from these overall nationwide um, aggregates. And again, these final two points point to huge limitations in epidemiological surveillance of the population. And it's in this resource limited context that, um, and that the initial groundwork for the CDS was, was created through what, what is called the virus program. And this is a program that was spearheaded by the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí, their school of medicine one of the foremost schools of medicine in Mexico. And it, it stands for the surveillance of respiratory infection and creation of health units. And the emphasis actually on the creation of health units, which I'll get into in, in, in a while longer. And this interventional model inspired by the UN as a methodology is to face COVID with the creation of these health units on focused on reducing risks of biological agents in specifically vulnerable communities. And I mentioned this because at the beginning, there was also an express focus on the Huasteca region of San Luis Potosí, this, this jungle area with, a, with a, large concentration, a larger concentration relatively of indigenous communities in the state. And, the, and part of the virus program is that it was focused on collective community actions to address pandemic. And there was an accumulated risk approach. And, and all of this, the, the key tool in this accumulated risk approach was a multimodal modal vulnerability index that was created by epidemiologists and local doctors to uh, roughly correlate with the specific incident or the risk that an individual has at a moment of time 
for respiratory infection and not necessarily COVID. And four key elements that, that influence the vulnerability index are the comorbidities, access to health services that an individual might have, economic status of individuals, and other co-threats of the chemical, physical, and biological kind. And the, the, originally this vulnerability index through task forces from the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí's medical school um, was, was implemented at, at a community level at different regions around San Luis Potosí. But ultimately this entire project and the key point to take from all this is that this was right before the creation of the CDS. And there was already this existing environment of fruitful collaboration between policy and in, in all of this, I failed to mention that a large portion, the key pillar of this virus program, in addition to the UASLP, was the, the Secretary of Health of San Luis Potosí, uh, known by SSSLP. And, and so already there was this confluence of policy and practice prior to the creation of the CDS. And so the Sentinela de la Salud, the Health Sentinel, um, is a part of this community-based health system for the virus program. And it, it integrates mobile technology in the form of an app uh, for Android phones, for COVID-19 triage, that implements this survey that I mentioned. And we'll go a little bit more into the details of the actual survey and risk levels to assess at the individual level, um, the risk level of users of the application. And at the same time, it obtains geographical information of where the responses to the survey are being made. Um, and, and, and so on one end, it gives users the risk level that they have under the, um, the virus approach methodology. And this also provides a, 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 a way of filtering and key public health information to users as a function of the risk level that they have given the, virus, uh, the um, response to the platform. And ultimately the, the core components of the system are a back end for the logic and data flow control, the mobile app that I mentioned, and also this front end that provides a funnel of this public health information and also some geographic information on different um, risk levels across the states. And all this information, of course, is maintained privately in a supercomputing center that exists at the EPC um, un under compliance with uh, the highest standards of Mexican law. And so now that we can go into a little bit more of the details behind the actual survey and the methodology of the CDS. So the Health Sentinel survey at, at a first level elicits general information on ethnicity, and this uh, importantly elicits information on whether an indiv individual pertains to an indigenous community or not, occupation, what form of health services that an individual might use, the home environment being the number of individuals in a home, um, and baseline protection in terms of uh, um, sanitary actions that an individual might take, as well as a support network. And this is a key social component that was important during the initial cases of the viral spread of, you can think about this, whether an individual can self-isolate or not, or they have a support network or not. And in addition to this, the risk survey, which is in this table on the left, had questions, eight main questions on three different categories that uh, focused on contact factors, whether individuals have contact or had been outside of the state in a certain amount of time, um, in signs and symptoms as respiratory illness, um, and the potential risks or comorbidity factors uh, that the individual might have. And as a function of these uh, questions and the answers, mm -hmm. on the right-hand side, we have a, the, the actual uh, risk level assigned. That, and this is the, the function that was created by our medical team and our epidemiological team as a, as a way of triage and as a way of filtering public health messages, again, in the early stages of the pandemic. And the front end of the users of the app looked something like this, where you have, this is actually the San Luis metropolitan area, and there, there are instances of different risk indices in different locations and, and quantities that a user can see. And the interesting collaboration here with the public health authorities was that actually we were able to be obtained access to retroactively understand how this compared to the tests that were actually done for qPCR in this initial period of the pandemic. And in these initial months, remember I mentioned there was very limited testing, there were roughly 10,000 tests that were administered in these initial months of the pandemic. And we, we split our study into two epochs, the first being from April to May, and the rest from, from April to the end of July, the full duration of tests that we obtained. And of these 10,000 tests, roughly 9,500 had known postal addresses that we could correlate a specific geolocation to. And, um, and the tests also included uh, demographic, state when symptoms started, and when the diagnosis was confirmed. And from this, we can extrapolate uh, several actual clusters of COVID that had happened during the study period. 
And so the, the key uh, statistical question that we're looking at is well, based on the fact that like influenza, COVID-19 spreads in clusters. And, and on the left we see, and we'll, we'll delve more into the visualization of the data that we obtained over the, the course of, of these four months, but the statistical questions that we ask ourselves are, first of all, are the data points homogeneously distributed? Um, and again, this is going back to trying to uh, find clusters in the first place. And if not homogeneously distributed, then can we at least, are they distributed according to the population density or some other distribution that might represent the, the inherent bias in the responses that we might see from the, from the, from the app in the first place? And beyond this, once we see whether this, this is the case or isn't, we can see if there are statistically significant clusters and if they persist over time. Um, and so with these questions in mind, uh, we can go into the results and what we saw over these four months of initial data. Um, and well, the first kind of core overall participation results is that we had roughly one and a half thousand responses in the mm -hmm. survey of the app in, in, in this initial stages of the pandemic, roughly split halfway through men and women. And with, again, that we have this bias of, an early, of a younger age of responses, roughly the average age of responses is around 33 years old. And, and here we can see the frequencies of the responses of the different levels of risk that were categorized according to the function specified by the virus program and the Secretary of Health of the state. And what the, the first salient feature of this is of course that the bulk majority of cases are, uh, are of the no risk category of the multiple different risk, uh, risk categories that we can have, um, roughly 78%. And then the remaining 20% are split throughout the lower to extremely high risk categories of, um, of the survey mm -hmm. answers. And, um, and again, we, I, I present this here, but I refer all of you in case you're interested to more nuanced information to the full version of the paper, um, which, which we have online. But, uh, but, and here are some visualizations of, of the answers uh, that we, of the, of the risk categorizations that we saw across AGBs. And the AGBs are the most basic unit of um, statistical measurement under the, um, the national, um, body of, of statistical um, measurements of, of Mexico, uh, the INEHI. Um, and so the, these images from the top left is no risk. B is a, from, from A to F are an increasing risk. And we can see here the, the relative densities of responses that uh, are of, of increasing risk as we go from A to F. And we, we see that there are seemingly different um, biases in terms of where the, the risk cases are over the course of the four month period of the study. And so to, to make a more nuanced spatial point analysis, uh, we used um, three main techniques. Uh, well, at, at a first level um, was simply looking at a kernel dens uh, density estimation of the frequency of, uh, of cases we saw at different risk levels, treating it as a point process. And um, from this, we could see empirical epicenters um, for, for different bandwidths of the kernel. And, um, and eventually we also looked at uh, more descriptive statistics of the point process in the form of K and L functions that, um, that allow us to see at, at different uh, spatial scales, whether there is a clustering or dispersion, and also allows us to filter over specific locations and see where there can be empirical clusters in the data. And, and ultimately this gives us the cluster detection that, uh, that as we can see, we'll see actually correlated with cases that um, were, were verified under the information given by the Secretary of Health. And so the, the first technique was, is that of density estimation. And here is a, um, of all the contributions that we have. And, um, and the, here is of, of, of no risk uh, responses that we have in, um, um, in our survey. And uh, as we can see the epicenter of the risk responses in different locations across the metropolitan area. Now for the spatial analysis, um, we look at Ripley's K and L functions, which uh, not to delve into too many details, is just simply quantifying at different spatial scales, how much the empirical distribution of the point process we see deviates from being uh, either homogeneous or in, in this case, comparable to some baseline distribution that uh, mm -hmm. governs the point process. And the baseline distribution that we used was that of the population density to account for a certain amount of the bias and responses that we got. And, um, and the, the way that we visualize the, the K and L functions is through these graphs as on the right-hand side, where this essentially counts at a given spatial scale the points that occur at a distance, from, at a given distance from each other. That's the X-axis is the distance that can be modulated. 
And these bands are under MCMC um, uh, uh, empirical runs of uh, the baseline point process where we expect the, the clustering, to, they're, they're, we expect some clustering to occur naturally. And when we see significant deviations of this graph above these bands is when we actually say that we can empirically witness some clustering with high probability. And so then we modulating different, uh, uh, the different spatial scales, we can see different clusters. And these clusters are consistent with um, specific places of outbreaks, such as X uh, mercantile neighborhood in San Luis Potosí. And so, so the final key takeaways is that there is strong correlation between these verified cases. And this is a potential useful uh, predictive tool in early stages of the pandemic when there are very few resources. And, um, and we're in current iterations of including this form of triage with other um, with other um, diseases that can occur uh, naturally um, in, in winter months of, of the pandemic. And um, I think we've run out of time to talk about some of our experiences of bridging policy and practice, but I mentioned the important points being of the existing uh, collaborative atmosphere and the ease of communication that we had with policymakers. And, um, and, and finally, just some future steps. We have data that we're analyzing from this past year and we're turning this into a tool that can inform policy in real time for other forms of resource allocation as well. And um, hopefully we can inform vaccination campaigns and extend the functionality of this tool as a public health communication tool. Again, focusing on community-based approaches as in the spirit of the virus program. Uh, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to find me and gather or uh, shoot me an email.